sought in chess is to is to find some empirical evidence regarding its impact. And there have been many studies conducted over the years in, in many different countries. And uh, I have to say that on the whole, these results have been fairly positive towards chess. Uh, but we are aware that many of these studies are um, fall somewhat short of the high standards of social sciences nowadays. And so the results are not necessarily um, to be trusted, not, a, not against the requirements of many, let's say, educational authorities, which are really looking for very hard evidence. So we're very pleased that uh, we're able to uh, introduce today a couple of uh, speakers who've been doing a lot of work in this field and uh, who have produced uh, reports with um, a, a proper analysis, if you like, of the, of the data. And um, the first speaker is John Jerim, who is uh, sitting at the desk. And he is going to talk about a major study that was undertaken, funded by the Education Endowment Foundation. It was undertaken in, in the UK, or in England, and it has um, uh, produced some results which some of us found a little bit surprising, but, you know, this is why we're here. And uh, the second speaker is Gianluca Argentin, who has conducted uh, studies in Italy. And uh, Gianluca will be able to explain his results as well. Following that, uh, we are going to have a discussion this will be led in the first instance by Giovanni Sala, who is a PhD candidate at uh, Liverpool University, and uh, who has actually been doing a lot of work in a similar field, and has looked very carefully at uh, uh, the work that uh, John and uh, John Luca has conducted. Right. Okay. So. Uh, what was the intervention that we uh, looked at? So children as part of the chess and schools program received 30 hours of chess instructions uh, from trained tutors in England during one academic year, which is year five in England. That's when children are aged kind of nine or 10. It followed the chess and schools and community team uh, curriculum fully developed by then. And it was accompanied by a optional uh, after school club as well. And so, um, the question we're trying to answer was: Does chess teaching primary school children to primary school children chess, particularly this year group, lead to a sustained or some kind of sustained impact on their educational attainment? And we look at maths, reading, and science, and within mathematics, we look at mental arithmetic as well. So we've kind of got a, a range of outcomes. I should also say, feel free to interrupt me as I'm going through. I'm happy to take questions as we go. Uh, forward. About 50 children, 50 kids. And so that is that is tiny, it brings a lot of kind of uncertainty, but it also kind of brings particular statistical problems that I won't go into today, but we can talk about afterwards. Part of those statistical problems though does mean that you're likely to get inflated effect sizes when you just have a very small number of specific individuals from a small number of schools. Yes. Uh, is the goal of a meta-analysis not to correct for those effects and see what's going on across all those studies? Yeah, ideally, ideally, yes. In reality, meta-analyses don't do that. So you think this meta-analysis did not achieve that? I think very few meta-analyses actually achieve that. So I wouldn't say it's particularly a criticism of this meta-analysis. I'd say it's a criticism more generally of meta-analyses. Having said that, I do think it's a particular problem in this example, simply because sample sizes are generally so small. So I think meta-analyses, uh, my wife's a doctor actually, and she's kind of got this very uh, taut view drilled into them where meta-analyses are the best, and then it's randomized trials, and then it's uh, quasi-experimental, blah, blah, blah. And it's not quite as, um, as clear-cut as that. There are issues in meta-analyses as well. OK, HS. <laughs> I've got no kind of uh, particular ax to grind, or not. But why was I kind of interested in this? Well, from a kind of policy point of view, uh, the intervention is kind of cheap to implement. So if you do find a positive impact, then it's likely to be cost-effective. 
Therefore, there was quite serious money pumped into this project. So I think the grant from the uh, EEF was around 700,000. Uh, then I'm sure I can find an effect somewhere. So what you kind of do is have a very rigorous, no, this is my hypothesis, these are my outcomes, and this is how I'm going to do my analysis. I am looking at this. And you publish that before you set up, and before you go into the field or anything, which is what we did. We had a protocol and we published it online. We said we're going to do this and this is what we're going to do. So we did that and we basically used examination data in England. Um, children, the one I think of the key points is we're looking at the effect one year after the intervention is finished. Um, so yeah, it's both a matter of actually, and there's all the trials that have been conducted so far have only focused right at the end of the trial. And I think there is a debate about what point it's best to follow up, if you can only follow up at one point. Um, we would argue, actually, that having that later follow-up is probably more of a strength than it is a weakness. I can see the real benefit would have been something like a time two. What's the immediate effect? And then is the sustained yeah. over time, one year later in year six? So um, I think John Luke is going to kind of uh, talk about okay, that more in the Italian study, but I do think that's a, an important point. Do I want? <laughs> I'm a data person. Do I want more data? Yes. <laughs> Always yes. Never no. <laughs> but the trouble with that is, like I said, going into a hundred schools, four thousand sure. kids doing the Thank testing you. is difficult. But also, those tests are going to be different to the follow-up tests. And even if you see what might look like fade out effect. Just say you've got an effect at time point one and nothing at time point two. Well, is that because that's a high stakes test and a low stakes test? Is that because of the effect of that as well, an RCT evaluation? For that, we, we kind of were in the opposite problem. It was again a year long intervention and we tested them right at the end, but there's no long run follow up. But the whole idea is that you have to start so. testing at the end here. So I, I might yeah, question exactly. Mark whether this year of no chess has completely so I went back, made it meaningless. So I went back to the uh, literature the other day and looked at kind of what's been said about what's often termed fade out effects, what happens kind of over a period of time after you've delivered an intervention. And it was quite interesting. So if you look at, uh, there's a study on IQ outcomes, which is you know, different to what we've got, but you think related. They find fade out effects take place over a matter of quite of a long period of time. For this age group? For this age group. Yeah, it was for, for children. It took an interest, right? Because obviously you could think about kind of the uh, relationships to this trial. That was run by a guy, uh, Darren, called Stephen Gorrard. He's a quite an aggressive academic. He's got camera as well. Hi, Stephen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, they found, we, whereas we kind of had a kind of very solid zero, yeah. they had a 0 0.1 effect size, which is small, very small. Well, it's not very, very small, but it is small. Stephen has a very particular perspective on statistical significance testing. The people know statistical significance testing is generally, basically it's you can rule out an effect, whether you can rule out effect being due to sampling variation. The fact you've got a sample of kids doing chess or philosophy rather than the entire population. In his philosophy trial, he didn't do any statistical significance testing because he doesn't believe it again, in, it, in this sense, with some valid arguments. If he would have done those statistical significance testing, his trial wouldn't have been able to rule out an effect of zero. Background, um, and lower levels of achievement, that was kind of, than England as a whole, that was kind of purposely as part of the design <coughs> because the Education Endowment Foundation had a particular remit to narrow the achievement gap, boost test scores of disadvantaged children. So it was good to kind of see our trial participants were very close to the eligible participants. And I can't remember which is treatment, which is control, but the key point is the two overlap, basically. Uh, and then we look at balance on other characteristics, so ethnicity, Pre-test scores, same people, so kind of about five, five, six, seven, something like that percent. That was mainly either kind of kids leaving the country, sometimes kids moving to school, sometimes there's linking 
issues is to kind of generally does that have any impact? Uh, no. So we looked at mathematics. The effect size was basically zero. Reading slightly positive. Science basically zero. Sorry, this is probably depressing, isn't it? <laughs> Mental arithmetic basically zero. We looked at boys. No, this. But what's what's the p value? Sorry. Very uh, I was going trying to skip over that. So when I was talking about statistical significance testing, basically this is whether you can say it's statistically significant or not. When you kind of try and take that into account. One important point actually that I haven't mentioned yet is um, schools were free to choose which um, subjects they dropped as well. well. That was right, wasn't it? They were allowed to yeah, pick. Th this is one real problem with it actually. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a few of them dropped maths, which even though being told specifically not to do so. And they, I, my, by they me were, in a telephone call, by the way. But, yeah. They were um, <laughs> fairly heroic teachers yeah. who uh, kind of dropped mathematics. Again, we did some analysis of that, looking at whether they dropped maths or not, and we didn't see kind of a huge difference in the results. Again, it actually made I think our data collection there was actually inadequate. I mean, I just came across a few by chance who yeah. told me, and so probably should have done more about when, that. Actually. So um, yeah. I had a spreadsheet by the end that had sort of 45 of the school saying what they had dropped. I wasn't oh, sure you? if it came either from you or from the guys doing our process evaluation side of things. Maybe if the process evaluation people did that collection, because the information that I sent, which was really just a couple of emails saying, oh, look, I've discovered yeah, four yeah. or five of them dropped math. This is, ah, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Know, what's happening? Uh, but but it would be interesting to know if the process evaluation people I'm sure did I've that. got that spreadsheet. Yeah, that would be good, actually. Quick, so I can send it through. Yeah, you, yeah, I'm intrigued by that, because I would never imagined they'd do that. Literally the reverse of what they were. But I, th I think what happened was a lot of the head teachers thought, ah, this is a great idea. We're going to replace chess with math. They just didn't read it properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. I mean, if I was teaching a school, I probably wouldn't choose to take that step. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a question on this regard? Uh, if you had, let's say, five maths lessons a week, and you <coughs> reduce it to four maths lessons a week, and it makes no difference to children's performance in mathematics, then, uh, why, then why don't we do that? Uh, so we've got no particular evidence of that because we've got what four or five schools that right, chose right. to drop mathematics, right. and they were self-selected schools. So, uh, right. well, I don't have any evidence to kind of substantiate that. So you could go in and tr do something else in a school instead. The only trouble is that you have to do that other thing well. So we need another intervention that can go in there well, and you need more schools. So we that would be a third treatment arm. We would have needed another 50 schools um, and we would have needed another group to deliver a high quality robust kind of intervention so that adds on more costs more technical difficulty and you know what if I could run a 20 arm trial testing kids a hundred times afterwards I would but you have to make choices when designing Trials are harder than that, and it could be what we call Hawthorne effects. These kids in the philosophy trial are just, you know, because they know they're under observation, have been under this kind of intense program. It wouldn't be unusual to be finding something around. No, it's exactly the critique I made of the people seeing. I'm a people seeing enthusiast, philosophy enthusiast, and chess enthusiast, but I made that critique of the people seeing trial before it was actually implemented, and I think it's actually quite wrong the claims that have been made in philosophy, and I speak as an enthusiast. Because yeah. I don't think we've got the data to, uh, to support that. No, I, I, I agree, and I agree completely on the philosophy trial. There, there should be no way that people could be able to conclude from the EEF studies that philosophy has more impact on academic outcomes than chess, because you can't compare what they've done across the two. No way. Uh, and I think, that, you know, there's no time to go into it here, but there's a lot of things I do, I do differently uh, in terms of the intervention now. Uh, and I think... Uh, I think one of the one of the objectives of the charity is try and do another try and do another study actually, yeah. Um, because certainly in terms of what we actually deliver and how we deliver it and the attention that we can give to each of the schools, which frankly, when we did this study, the charity was only in its infancy, and there were two people in head office at the time. Now you know now effectively there are seven or eight, and I don't think we were able really to do it to do it justice in terms of the support that we gave to our tutors <coughs> simply because you know literally we started it in february and delivered it in september and there were some holidays in between and 
it's actually it's quite difficult. It's the reality of taking something from small scale. So I said earlier about the studies with 50 odd kids, taking it to scale. Yeah. The reason why the Education Endowment Foundation got you guys in was because they were amazed that you guys did so well to kind of get so many schools so quickly. So they have done stuff in equal a rushed time. It's just no one's pulled it off as well as you guys yeah. being able to kind of you know, get those schools in and to get them to stay. Yeah, but I mean, the thing is, like, we, did, we, agree. we did the recruitment well, but that was to an extent at the expense of being able to give much more attention to, you know, to support to the tutors who were doing it and, and more thought to what it was we were going to actually deliver and whether or not this delivery was, if you like, suited to the outcome that was being tested. And so, you know, if I had my time again, I have to tell you, I'd do so many things radically, radically differently. Yeah. 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 Where you don't have random samples. So the wait, the reason why I don't like the waiting is what are you waiting for? Yeah. 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 Yeah.